Okay. I think I am live now, but I am going to go share this really quickly. I know this is a weird time. Um, I'm going to go share this really quickly in the Facebook group. Just to kind of get it out there since I don't have slick text anymore. I was just spending way too much <clears throat> on that. So I'm going to go share it. I'm hoping my microphone does an okay job getting it out. Um, it keeps doing something wonky with, um, it keeps going out. I think this thing that my, uh, my husband needs to buy a new one that's hooked into the computer because it keeps going out. Okay. That's posted. All right. And there are some ladies watching. That's good. Make sure that you tell me as we go, if the audio is good, I am using the good microphone, but like I said, I might have to switch to computer audio if it goes off just because the thing that plugs into the computer is being weird. So, okay. Thanks, Sarah. Good. Okay. So let's delve into this. Shall we? <laughs> um, Oh, and my husband just told me you might want to turn up the mic. I think I can turn it up by this. Okay. Tell me if that's good. Hopefully that's okay. Um, and hi, Kelly. Kelly's watching me right now. My little Kelly. How you doing, Kelly? I'll be back in a little bit. She's like super attached to me now because my husband and Abby have been gone for four days. So I'm all that she's had besides Chloe. And we know obviously her siblings, but she's really attached to me right now. So hopefully that works. Um, Tom, let me know if the audio is good. Okay. Everyone's saying it sounds good on. Okay, good. Okay. This, um, is a deep, heavy subject just because I know this is controversial. Um, I know that so many women, thousands of women, I personally, and I'll get into this. I have not met any that it has personally helped their marriage, this book, but I know thousands and thousands of women swear by it and they get very territorial of it. So if anyone says anything against it, their hackles go up and they get really bent out of shape about it. Um, and I want to be careful as I'm going through this, there are some biblical principles in this book. I will say that, but there nothing, there's just something that didn't set well with me the entire time. Now I will put a disclaimer out there. I might've had a little bias because my husband has always, he has very good intuition, intuition when it comes to people. And he's always been a little creeped out, um, by Michael Pearl, especially and reading through the book. And then some of other Michael Pearl's other works. Um, yes, I went down the crazy rabbit trail and I um, looked up some of his books and downloaded them. And I can see why my husband felt like it was off. So I'll kind of get into that. I'm going to try to keep this at an hour. I don't know if I'll succeed. I have a lot to go through. I have a lot to talk about. This is a really, really thick book. It's 400 some pages. It is 477 pages. So I stayed up until 2 a.m. <laughs> Thursday night, reading Creative Bee has helped me. My husband and Abby are in Colorado this week for her senior trip. But then I did delve into some other Michael Pearl material. So I'm going to be going through this book and talking about some of the red flags that popped up as I went through it. I'm going to give my complete analysis at the end of the book. Um, I could just do it now, but I did want to read some of the stuff out of the book. I do believe that this book has some good mixed in, and I don't want to discard the biblical principles, but I also don't think we should take advice from someone who has a twisted view when it comes to staying with an abusive man. And she advocates for that or, and Michael Pearl advocates for this. And I'll read part of the article where he says this at the end, a man who has molested your children. Um, I'll link to the article down below of where he advises that. And I'll also read the portion at the end of this review. So I first read this book a long time ago, many, many years ago. It was not out very long. Um, I was a young wife and mom. Since I'd not been married very long, I devoured every word. And I will say probably the first five years of our marriage were the toughest in regards to us just figuring stuff out. You know, we had, we were two completely different human beings living together now, completely different upbringings. And it takes a little while to adjust and meld when you are in the first five years of marriage. Um, so even only being married a few years, though, I remember when I read it, um, 
I went along with the hype. Yeah, this is great. This is great. But there were some red flags and there were some unsettling things. Even when I read it, I had not read it since then. So it's probably been 16 years or so since I had read it 15, 16 years. I don't even know when it came out. Um, it was, it's been a long time over 10 years. So now when I read it, you know, now I have 21 years of marriage. And so I feel like I'm a little, I have some experience under my belt and also being in the ministry for over 20 years and counseling with people and hearing other people's stories and testimonies. I feel like I'm more able to give advice. I'm one of the more aged women now. I mean, only, I'm only like 10 years younger than Debbie was when she wrote this book. So now those red flags were blazing when I was reading it. Um, but I finally feel ready to give an honest review of this book. So I did, I purchased it on my Kindle. I went through, I'm going to be flipping through my Kindle quite a bit. It's kind of difficult more so than just a regular book. So bear with me, um, as we do it. Okay. Ready? Oh, you've been warned. So buckle up. Okay. So I'm going to kind of get into this. I wrote down just as I was going through it, some of the things that really stuck out to me. Now, some of the biggest, um, warning sign warning things for me kind of came near the end in the middle of the book. I would say there probably was some good advice such as, um, there is a part about how to run your home smoothly. And I had actually incorporated some of these ideas and it worked great as far as, um, menu planning. And then just kind of, it showed you Sunday, what to do on Sunday, what to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, kind of building off of these crock pot meals to help you run the house smoothly. And when I had three young kids, it helped a lot. So there are some good things. Um, I'll also go over it when I get to it. There is something written by, um, actually the things that I found the most informative were things that were written by other people <laughs> that she included in the book. And I thought that was funny and I didn't sense that same spirit in it. So there's just, you know, life in the Christian life and discernment is more than just one, two, three checklist, do this. And this will be the result. You, you have to have the spirit of it. And I'm going to go into it more, but the whole spirit of this book was one of fear. Um, and I just, that's what I felt throughout the whole theme was fear throughout this book. And I'll kind of get into that more, but let's start on. Okay. So page 31 through 35 was the first thing that I really saw the introduction, you know, yeah, it's, fine, whatever. Um, I didn't really see too many. Well, I will say I did see a red flag in just how they got married. That was a weird story. Um, he basically threw in the air after she told him in a dark parking lot, I want to have your son someday. He ran around the house three times, threw her in the air and said, let's get married. And eight days later they did. And their honeymoon really put off a lot of red flags and their honeymoon story is actually in a book that he wrote, um, creating to have a help me or something, something geared towards men. And let me just say that his recounting of the honeymoon story was terrifying. And I felt so bad for his wife and I can kind of see why she wrote this book later. I think she had to adjust to Michael Pearl's um, ideal of her in order to survive. And I don't know, the accounting is just weird. My friend, Mrs. Jujana Anderson actually did a, a little uh, video about that honeymoon story. I had watched it a long time ago. I tried, and that's, here's another disclaimer. I tried not to watch anything, any kind of book reviews before I did my own, because I wanted my own thoughts in my head. Um, but I had remembered that that was a really weird story. So I went and I looked it up. And yeah, I can see why I had red legs through this book. So anyways, uh, she says, men are created to be the helpers of God. Jesus willingly became a helper to the father. The Holy Spirit became a helper to the son. So then she's just going on about how we all have these, you know, we are, it's structured society, a structure where we must have submit to everyone. God made you to be a help me to your husband. So you can bolster him, making him more productive. You're not on the board of directors with an equal vote. So here she's saying, you know, you don't have a voice at all you're not equal with your husband. He is, you know, above you, which I would say that men, yes, in a marriage, um, they do have the final say, but one thing that was missing throughout this whole thing was, and I know this was addressed towards women. She leaves out completely 
the part where Christ tells husbands to love their wives as the church and Christ gave himself for the church. So someone, a husband who is fully loving his wife the way he needs to be, a lot of this stuff won't even per pertain to um, that we're gonna be going over in the book. Um, so I don't, I do believe that man is the head, like the Bible says, but I do believe that women also have a voice. And if a man is going to love you as Christ loves the church, then he's going to listen to your voice. Okay. So, um, we call, we go on, she says something, um, on page 35, when he first fell in love with you, you were a sweet little thing full of laughter and fun from the very bottom of your soul. You were thrilled with him every day. You woke up planning some activity that involved you both. Is he still married to the same sweet little thing or have you become a long faced sickly complainer? Has your lover seen your sunshine lately? Is he still your lover? What would he say? Okay. So full stop here. <laughs> After you have a few kids, things are going to start changing. When you wake up in the morning, your whole life is not, your whole mind is not revolving around him. Suddenly you've got a million other things, especially if you're homeschooling, if you're running the home. Um, so through the years, women are going to change. And to think that a woman is going to be the same sweet, innocent, little bubbly thing that at 40, that she was at 20 with no responsibilities yet, as far as children, not raising them, not homeschooling them, is just, um, you're delusional. People change throughout the years. You know, your husband changes, uh, you change. And part of your vows is accepting each other with the changes. I'm not condoning going around with a sour look on your face all the time, but for you to just completely be consumed every minute of the day about him is just, it's not, I, and I, I don't think most men would like it if their women were, I don't know, maybe my husband can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, um, he kind of likes it that, you know, I'm not so needy as to, I'm just constantly thinking about him, needing him, wanting him, you know, et cetera. So that is one thing I noticed. Um, and that part now on page 40, she goes into, and I'm going to see this theme. We're going to see the same theme throughout here a lot in this book. Um, she talks a lot about men who have affairs and men who are into pornography. And at the end, they talk about men who are molesting their children. Mm. Oh, that is really where <laughs> I got heated near um, the end, but she's talking about how, you know, um, this man, you know, he is, she says, I'm not suggesting this is your fault, that you're the cause of your husband's sin, but that is the theme throughout the book. It all goes back to the wife. It's always the wife wife's fault when the husband falls because she wasn't there sexually for him. She wasn't, you know, providing enough smiles for him. She was nagging him too much. So throughout this book and throughout her husband's book, I notice a theme of it's always the woman's fault. Um, even when it comes to lust, a woman's skirt was too short. It's her fault that he lusted. And I completely disagree with that. Where I do think we need to be feminine and modest, men are, men are in control of their own actions. Men also took the vow that they would remain faithful to them till death did them part. So don't tell me that it's all the woman's fault when a man goes out and starts looking at the secretary in ways he shouldn't be looking. So she kind of goes into this. And then she says, you know, if he were a godly man, he wouldn't consider his needs. You know, he wouldn't care that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But then she says, recognize you're at war, talking about the secretary at work that he's sleeping with, for the preservation of God's most noble institution on earth, the family, your family. And this is the part I have issue with. Make yourself more attractive than the secretary. Okay. You can win if you are willing to lose your pride. Never demand that a man love you and cherish you because he ought to earn every smile and shared moment. So this, a lot of what she says comes across as we are earning our husband's love. We are earn, you know, and I understand that some things, especially at the beginning of a marriage, your husband hasn't learned to trust you when it comes to certain things, such as decisions or financial decisions, or, you know, and as, as years go by, he does start to trust you in those areas. You know, um, the heart of her hu husband doth safely trust in her. But when it comes to fidelity, there should be no question that you are his and he is yours. And the Bible does say that you are one. So that means, and the Bible also tells the husbands to fraud, not your wife, you know, um, it's, so it goes both ways. 
here. So when it comes to fidelity, I am going to demand that my husband remains faithful to me. Um, there are going to be in life more attractive women that come across my husband's path. It's not up to me to make sure I outdo them, that I work out at the gym five hours a day so I can be skinnier than the secretary, you know, that I always look perfect, that I'm always perfectly put together. You know, that's just an unrealistic expectation and you shouldn't need to. My husband should have no eyes for anyone other than me. That husband at that job doesn't even need to look at the secretary. He needs to give off the vibes. I'm taken. No, you know, I'm taken. So exactly, Kirsten, I agree. God never tells women to win men over being attractive. What does God des describe as virtues in the Bible? You know, um, look at those. We have to be more attractive. It's a big red flag there. If you want to keep your man and the father of your children, you're going to have to forget your rights as a wife and forget his Christian obligation to his vows. I'm not going to forget. <laughs> I'm not going to forget that his obligation to the vows. Your husband is going to love what is lovely to him. You must be more lovely than, than she. You must beat her at her own game. A man is attracted to the vulner, vulnerability in a woman, the blush, the need, the dependence. When she is physically aware of him, impressed by him, emotionally aroused by his presence, he's excited by her. Oh, I just, oh, I, this is horrible, horrible advice right here. <laughs> it is your best interest to learn to use feminine wiles. You know, I seem to remember um, women in Proverbs using things like physical attractiveness and their physical wiles to lure men, and they were usually prostitutes. So this is, this is horrible advice. Oh, okay. So anyways, be creative and aggressive in your private, intimate times. Keep him drained at home so he won't have any sexual needs at work. If you feed him well, emotionally and sexually, her cooking won't tempt him. That is just wrong. I have known men that enjoy the physical relationship with women so much that it doesn't matter how much their wife is sexually attracted to them. They will still go out and cheat on her because they're just the thrill, the thrill of cheating. It's an adrenaline rush. You know, um, there are men like that out there. So, so no, you know, some men are just rotten and some men are just that lustful that no matter what you do at home, I, I cannot stand how they blame the wife for every single one of the husband's issues in this book. And it's very, very prevalent throughout the entire book. Um, in her writings and in his, the husband takes no responsibility for his actions. So um, that is, that's horrible advice. Okay, so then page 42, I think that was what I just read. No, that's 41, what's on 42? Okay, yeah, that was, that was 41. God stands with you when you stand by your man, but you will stand alone if you insist on standing by your rights. Always remember that the day you stop smiling is the day you stop trying to make your hair marriage heavenly. And it is the first day leading to your divorce proceedings. Um, I agree. A process of change. It's obvious that she knows nothing about men cheating. If she thinks looking good will stop it from happening. I absolutely agree. I have known men married to beautiful, beautiful women that to give them their needs sexually in bed and they still go out and they are chronic adulterers. So don't tell, that's, that's just horrible, horrible advice. And um, I wanted to point this out. It's the first day leading to your divorce proceedings. All throughout this book, it's women, you have to do this or you're going to get divorced. Do this or your man's going to leave you. Do this or he's going to do this. Do this or he's going to look at porn. Do this or he's going to sin. There's so much burden placed on the women, woman throughout this book. That honestly, when I closed this book, well, I had distaste and uh, it was when I had distaste in me the whole time reading it. But when I was done with this book, I felt such, I don't even know how, a feeling of bondage, a, a feeling of just, I felt weighed down. Um, I felt like, I felt like if my marriage fails, it's all my fault. <laughs> I knew that's not true, but that's how I felt after reading this book. Oh, so yeah, I think she is Charlene. And I, and I think that's, I think 
she wrote this book and we'll kind of get into the type of man that he is a little bit later. I think she wrote this book because she learned all those years, what she had to do to survive. She, she learned all these years, what she had to do. So maybe he wouldn't walk away. Maybe he wouldn't leave her. And, um, I just want to say that a difference, a huge difference in her marriage and mine is that I have never, since the day I said my vows and the day my husband said his vows, I've never sat there biting my fingernails. What if I nag him too much? Is he going to walk out the door? You know, oh, I had a bad day and I said some things to him I shouldn't have. Is he going to divorce me? You know, I never once thought that my, my marriage is not ruled by fear and his, his part of loving me, he doesn't sit around thinking, oh no, if I'm not good to my wife, if Cassandra's going to walk away, you know, we both, the fear is not involved in our marriage and I don't think it should be involved in any marriage. So <clears throat> Kirsten, that's a good point. They've done studies and more. And the more attractive men are more likely to be cheated on because they attract really negative men. Interesting. I, I believe it. I've seen some really, really um, good looking people in my life married to each other and they were, the spouses were cheating. So, okay. So page 56, I know I'm, this guy's, this might be longer. I'm sorry. I'm trying not to make it. I'm just, I'm getting more fired up too as I go. And I knew I would, I'm trying to only say the things that. God would have me to say, uh, but <clears throat> okay. So this was one of the first things I read that made me think that maybe just Michael Pearl is a jerk. <laughs> no, actually the honeymoon story. Whew, if you want to read that as a general rule, my husband just doesn't take the trash out. I could be annoyed or I could learn to enjoy taking the trash out. I'm smart. I have learned to really enjoy taking trash out. One day recently, my husband saw me struggling out the door with a huge sack of trash in one hand and several empty boxes in the other. Since he was headed in that direction, he volunteered to carry the heavy sack. He walked about 10 feet ahead of me, holding the sack out from his body with one hand. I knew he was just showing me how strong he was. I was amused, as usual, with his display of manhood. Uh, Michael Pearl seems he, you know, and I think a lot of men are like this, but he seems over the top with how much he talks about how virile, virile he is, how good in the bedroom he is, how he's a sexual man, how, you know, so even throughout his writings, it really comes across a very braggadocious, very arrogant in that area. Um, after nearly 35 years of having me appreciate his muscles, you would think he would tire of showing off, but he knows I've never tired of watching him perform. When he got near the large trash trailer, he was really getting to his macho thing with great fanfare. He flung, I would say toss, but it was like a sideways catapult, the large trash bag as if it were a cement block instead of a thin plastic bag too loaded down for its own strength. Of course, the string broke, allowing the bag to hit the side of the trailer, bursting open and dumping trash all over the ground. I could tell he was a little embarrassed. Get this as I rushed over to clean up his mess. <laughs> so he tells her he's going to take the garbage out. He makes a mess of it and then he just leaves it. Nice. I remember a time when all this would have irritated me to the point of bitterness. I would have made sure he felt my irritation and our relationship would have been strained all for a bag of trash. Such a stupid waste of our lives. But now as I watched him humbly, humbly slink off, I had to grin. Okay. So I just kind of showed that to show how he just, he doesn't really care. He just expects her to clean up his whole mess, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You would think he would at least clean up the mess when um, he's made it. So then she goes on to tell the story about how she throws a, uh, plays a prank on him. And then he like rushes in and basically they, she brags about their sexual time that happens after that, which is really weird to me. That seems to be a theme throughout this book. Um, you know, maybe she learned that she really did have to be available, whatever hours of the day, whatever hours of the night, because he, um, had a problem in their area. I don't know. <clears throat> so, uh, 71 is the next one that I, the next page that I have, if you have this book, oh, and you're reading along then. <laughs> Go ahead and turn to that. Okay, so she said, a woman's calling is not easy. To allow someone to, else to control your life is much harder than taking control of it yourself. It can be a challenge even for veteran wives. So she says, she basically um, says here that her calling has not been easy being married to Mark, Michael Pearl. And I can kind of see why from some of the stories. But um, my, I, I feel a little differently about that. I actually feel like it's harder to be a mom than it's harder to be a wife. Um, I find much, much, I find joy in both relationships, but with raising children comes a lot more work. Um, 
if you just don't try to change your man and you just love your man and you just stand by your man and he is your best friend and you enjoy life together, I don't feel like it's that difficult. I know marriage, you know, you have to work on it. You have to make sure that communication stays open, all that good stuff. It can be hard at different seasons of your life because there are different seasons of your life where it's, you're going to be at each other's throats or whatever. But um, my calling, I, I would not say that I feel like my calling is hard being married to my husband. So that I kind of um, jumped out to me because I do, I get the impression through this book that she has had a more difficult time than most when it comes to her husband. So that is the impression that I got. Okay. So page 76 was my next. Okay. So she's telling us, um, what are God's blueprint for marriage? And number three, she says, number one, God commands wives to submit to their own husbands. I understand and complete. I completely agree with that. God informs men that they are the head of the wife. Agreed. And then God tells the wives to be subject to their husbands in everything, every decision, every move, every plan in all everyday affairs. So that kind of struck out to me because that seems really weird that a husband would want to be involved from my own experience. What goes on at home during the day while my husband is gone? He mainly has just, he has a few expectations. Okay. That the house isn't chaos when he gets home, that the kids have done school and then he eats when he gets home. So I don't think, I think if I was calling him up every single time with something, Hey babe, what time should I make supper today? What, you know, what do you want for supper? Usually he's like, Hey, what's for supper? He doesn't um, want me to run it by him all the time. I find it odd that a man would want to be involved in a woman's everyday affairs. To me, it just shows that he's very, very controlling and wants to control every single aspect of her life. And that's just weird to me. I don't know. I, I don't get that. So <clears throat> I agree a process of change. She said, motherhood has been way easier. Oh, mar wit uh, I'm sorry. Um, it's been opposite for me, but motherhood has been way easier than marriage for me. This book did not help me at all. <clears throat> now process of change. Would you say that you got anything good from this book at all? Or, um, just tell me your overall thoughts and I would like to hear. So yeah, Angie, I agree. <clears throat> yeah, I agree, Kirsten. <laughs> if my husband dumped trash on the ground, I would be like, hey, babe, can you please help me clean up your mess? <laughs> and he probably would. I don't see why it's such a big deal. So, all right, then 77. Okay. So it says, you think I'm some kind of spiritual giant? She's asking, it's taken wisdom for me to understand a man, his ego, his tender heart, and his strong needs. It was nothing short of divine wisdom that enabled me to understand the destructiveness of taking personal offense. Listen, when my husband did things that seemed unfair, selfish, or harsh. Um, looking back on my 21 years of marriage, I can't describe things that my husband has done to hurt my feelings as harsh. So to say harsh indicates that, um, some pretty awful things have happened to her, but you know, she's just continued to try to change it. Your life will be full of dumped trash bag situations. Your husband will be selfish. He will be unkind. He will not respect your rights. He will be foolish. He may be cruel. He may be cruel. My husband has never been cruel. And that son of Adam may actually walk in sin but he cannot victimize you unless you react outside of the wisdom of God. You need the precious gift, gift of wisdom to be able to hold your tongue and to be thankful when your flesh would strike back in anger. Oh, and then she says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men and women in parentheses liberally. Um, now it's funny that she added the and women in here because it's specifically two men, other parts that she says, um, she's talking about the wives submitting to the husbands. And then she leaves out the parts that says, and let you be subject one to another. So it's funny that she would leave that out because the, the husband ever being subject to his wife, according to this book would be like the worst thing ever. It's just not going to happen. The husband is never supposed to be subject to the wife in every area er in any area. So I think it's funny that she. Um, mm, 
Yeah. And I agree a process of change because they put all of the blame on the woman. They don't, they don't factor the man in, in this at all. And I understand she's writing to the women, but it's, it's just, it's not, it's not feasible with some marriages where the man doesn't want to make it work. When the man is a chronic adulterer, when the man is abusive, when the man is molesting your children, there are some lines when it comes to marriage where you're just not going to be able to make it work. If he is not repentant, if he is not willing to make it work. So <clears throat> I know it's Sarah. I can't either. Can you imagine Aaron being cruel to you? And then her advice is just don't let your anger flare up. You know, you don't have any rights. Give up your rights. You know, just ask God to give you the spirit of thankfulness when your husband's cruel to you. So I just, Oh, I just, I can't, there's just too much in it. <laughs> All right. 82. And I'm going to be saying, I can't, I'm trying not to repeat myself, but there's just a lot. All right. We receive thousands of letters every year, mostly from bitter middle-aged spirit-filled women disappointed with their unspiritual husbands, wanting someone to take sides with them against their abusers. And I put this in here because she put abusers in parentheses because, or italics, because she's showing you abusers. Well, I'm going to say there are some men out there that abuse their wives. And according to advice later in this book, she encourages them to go back to them, even if they've tried stabbing them to death. So, and even when they've had children in the home and the man tries to murder her, she encouraged her to go back. So this is, this is what they're doing. They're encouraging wives to stay with men, no matter how abusive they're abusive. She put in quotation marks. Um, I understand that women, that the term emotional abuse can be overused. And, you know, your husband gets mad at you. He doesn't like something you're doing. And you're telling him he's emotionally abusing you when you just had a disagreement. I understand that you can overuse that, but there are true abusers, not abusers. Um, and it's not the woman's fault when men are abusers. So <clears throat> that really stuck out to me too. Um, okay. Let me see. I wrote some of my stuff is like and I can't even barely read it. Let's go to 113. I think I'm getting my point across though. Just the little few red flags that I saw, the parts where she's talking about her husband being cruel to her, um, men will be selfish. Okay, so now she gets into the three parts with um, command man, a steady man, and a visionary man. I do see that there are some, there are some good things with this. Um, I think my husband is probably a combination of all three. I wouldn't say that he fits really into any category because he does have some command traits because he is a preacher and he is the shepherd of this flock. So that kind of, um, goes into it, but even the way he does that would not be a Michael Pearl way. He doesn't say jump and everyone's like how high, you know, he relies more on the Holy spirit working through people's hearts in the church than him commanding them what to do. A visionary man someone who has grand, um, dreams and things for the future. And I would say that's part of him too, because we started this church, we planted the church and he had great plans for it. And then Mr. Steady, he does have those traits as well. Now I see that this could be helpful, um, to kind of pinpoint kind of like when you do the, um, personality tests and things like that. Like I am an ENTJ doing the personality test, but this could be, um, definitely, um, helpful to identify what type of man you are so that you can relate better to him. Um, but she says in here about her husband or about a command man. And she says a couple of times, my husband is a command man. You know, he says, jump. She says, how high he's like faster. Okay. You know, do it now. That's how he is. Um, she put a command man who has gone bad is likely to be abusive. It is important to remember that much of how a command man reacts depends on his wife's reverence towards him. Once again, putting it all on the woman. Let me read that again. It is important to remember that much of how a command man reacts depends on his wife's reverence towards him. When a command man lost or saved is treated with honor and reverence, a good help meet will find that her man will be wonderfully protective and supportive. So only if she does her job, he's only then in most marriages, the strife is not because the man is cruel or evil. It is because he expects obedience, honor, and reverence, and he's not getting it. Therefore he reacts badly. So 
It's all your fault. You're not giving them enough obedience, honor, and reverence. When a wife plays her part as a help meet, the command man will respond differently. Of course, there are a few men who are so cruel and so violent that even when a wife is a proper help meet, oh, there's the caveat. She's throwing that in there. He will still physically abuse her or the children. In such cases, it would be the duty of the wife to alert the authorities that they might become the arm of the Lord to do justice. And even when they tell someone that they need to alert the authorities, they tell them don't divorce him. Hopefully he'll get enough time and then he'll be out when the kids are grown. And then you can visit him and write him romantic love letters and make him food and just reignite your love and passion while he's sitting in jail. Oh, okay. So anyways, that was interesting how she said um, that about the command man that stuck out to me too. You think this is why she wrote the book? Because she had to learn how to, you know, be melded into the Michael Pearl perfection of a proper help me. I don't know, maybe. Um, page 159, some of this stuff, I read it so late in the night. <laughs> it's all become, it's all become um, fuzzy to me. So I hope I can remember the correct um, things that I wrote. Okay. So then someone, she says, you rarely hear a, a man say, God told me to do this, or God led me to go down there that I don't know where she gets that from. Because as a pastor's wife, we hear all the time from men saying, God told me to move here. God me, told me to go here. God told me to, you know, change this job. God told me to quit working, you know, um, and then she says, I know that when God does speak to my husband and leads him in a supernatural way, he will not speak of it in public. He doesn't feel the need to promote himself in that matter. And furthermore, he believes if he has truly heard from heaven, God doesn't need his publicity. That's good for your husband, but that's not the norm that I've seen with most men. So I don't know where she's getting that, um, that idea from. Let me see. I think this book would be fine if he had written a book called love her like Christ loves the church and then gave the same advice that men should sacrifice and put everything into their marriage. I think it might've been better if they would have done like alternate chapters, maybe, maybe alternate chapters, but everything is just so focused on it being all on the woman. And I don't understand why the responsibility of the marriage succeeding only lies on the woman. There's so much in scripture that is folk that is pointed to men as well, that it just comes off as very very one-sided and um i don't know there's just a lot of red flags and i'll get into it at the end mainly when it comes to this book being taken by um abusive cruel narcissistic men and then um just expecting their wives to follow every jot and tittle of this created be as help me without then doing their part that the bible specifically commands the bible always trumps books the bible always trumps man's words and um you know, they tend to forget that. So, all right. So 173 is another place that I put, let me see what I put there. Okay. So it says, let me see when, okay, this book. So she's talking about servitude or service, the power of holy joy. Um, there's this letter. And they get a lot of letters from women who are with truly abusive men, not abusive men. I've been reading your materials for years and respect your insights. I truly hope you can give me some advice about my friend. She's a believer who is married to a verbally abusive lost man. I work in their outer office, so I see the daily mistreatment. Many times when she instructs one of the children, her husband mocks her, telling the children their mother is a stupid piece of bad word and not to obey her. Often he has lined the children up and railed on them so severely they became weak with crying. They are nervous wrecks. He has on more than one occasion shoved the food off the table in a rage of anger when, anger when it did not suit him. There's no telling what will provoke him or when he will become provoked. She has read your book and really tries to win him with her obedience, yet her servitude seems to make him worse. She cooks, cleans, cares for the children, runs the family business while he spends his time behind closed doors, working on the books or some other iffy project of which I have never seen the results. The business would not need extra help from me if he did as much, work as, she, as much work as she did. Although there are some occasions when he does jump in and help organize the merchandise. When he does work, he is always browbeating his wife for her stupidity and changing what she's doing. He never treats her with kindness or show any signs of love. I believe he actually thinks he's too wonderful for her and it disgusts him that she is his wife. 
I have told her to write and seek help, but she thinks it would be dishonoring to her husband and doesn't like to talk about the prob problems. She works like a robot, despondent, broken, and more and more without hope. And that is, I'm kind of glad this woman wrote in because in my mind, that's kind of what I have seen as well in real life situations where the women have declared, decided that their bad marriage was all their fault. They read this book and then um, they tried implementing everything exactly as is, but because they were just married to a pile of garbage, it, nothing changed. And then they became despondent and without hope and just barely existing. It's discouraging watching their interactions from the other room. Surely this is not what you intended when you wrote your book, Created Be Has Helped Me. And then she said, Debbie said, this book is written to the approximately 95% of women married to the average cranky, unthankful, insensitive, bossy, self-centered man. And I would disagree with that. I don't think 95% of the husbands out there are like that. I know mine isn't. So um, when we ladies turn our focus to meeting the legitimate needs of our man, wonderful transformations occur in the old grouch and in us. <clears throat> when I wrote this book over 10 years ago, I was well aware of the other approximately 5% of the women like the one mentioned in the letter you have read. Those browbeaten, emotionally abused, sometimes physically abused wives are not exempt from are not exempt from the principles I have advanced, but their broken emotional state renders them incapable of understanding the difference between service and servitude and between humility and self -degrada degradation. Gracious, joyous service is healing to any relationship, but broken, sad surrender to a narcissistic tyrant or an addict elicits only disgust and further abusive behavior. So then they go on to um, say that this woman is an enabler. So, <laughs> oh, it would be funny if it wasn't so awful. So once again, it's all the woman's fault. <laughs> it's all this wife's fault because she's an enabler and she's enabling him to treat her this way. So they go on and they, um, they tell you what, what this lady can do to not be an enabler. And basically that is to stand up look him straight in the eye and say, no, you aren't going to do this. And they said that usually just like fixes every marriage that this is going on because he's like, wow, my wife stood up to me, but wait, haven't you been encouraging us in the book previously in the other pages, not to stand up to our man, not to fight for our rights, not to, you know, expect our husbands to be loving and gentle with us. Haven't you been telling us that? And now you are saying that you can't because, and if you don't, it's all your fault again, because you're an enabler. So oh, you can be a Proverbs 31 woman, even if he's a super jerk. Some tyrannical husbands have read this book and used it as leverage to intimidate their wives into degrading situations. I completely agree with that. You can just say no in a loving and respectful way. You don't need to lose your grace and dignity when we're refusing to be abused. Yeah. If he's hitting you, you don't need to scream. You don't need to say, stop doing that. You, you need to be gracious, even when he's physically abusing you. You can be a Proverbs 31 woman, even if he's a super jerk. So then she says, don't be an enabler. Oh, when he is hurtful to the children, acting like a fool, you can respond in one of three ways. Two of which will compound the problem. You can become the protector of the kids, screaming back at him, huddling the children around you, calling him names, threatening to leave him. In short, ditching your faith and dignity. So once again, it's all your fault. Or you can cower with the children, urging them to act in ways that will not provoke him, making them responsible to prevent his outbursts, remaining silent, offering no explanation as to his foul behavior because you do not want to dishonor him and possibly offering excuses for his devilish displays. The children will be hurt. And your husband will not know that the great pain he is causing is unacceptable, even abnormal. He will think he is normal and you are a wimp with no backbone who must be managed for your own good. These two responses are both enabling him to continue in his inappropriate behavior. Mm. So the third response is the road to healing. This sounds like worse when I'm reading it out loud. This sounds even worse when I'm reading it out loud than it was when I was reading it in my head. You're healing first and then the kids and possibly your husband's. This is the hard part. It will take a woman filled with the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. You will have, you will have to endure abusive words without feeling abused. You will have to live in the love of God when you are not getting love from your husband. You will have to gain your self-image from what God thinks of you instead of what your husband says in his selfishness and anger. You will need to put on the whole armor of God to stand against the fiery darts of the wicked one. Yes, the devil and your husband. You must wear two hats at the same time. So now, now you're taking a step further. Now you can't just be, now you have two hats. If you're an enabler, which is all your fault, then you have two hats you have to wear. 
Um, the loving submissive wife who honors her husband and the prophet who will not cover sin nor call evil good. You will not hide his sin from your children nor make excuses. When he acts inappropriately, inappropriately with you or the children and you see they are hurting later in private, explain to them he doesn't have the love of God in him and that he's being controlled by an evil spirit. Let them know it's his problem and not theirs, that he is unreasonable and they are normal. I do agree with that. It is not the children's fault that their dad is a raging maniac. Um, they should understand that their daddy is temporarily possessed of a debilitating moral disease that God can heal. So this is her advice. Stand taller. Look him in the eye. Do not return to your corner or wear the dunce's hat. When reviled, return a blessing. When persecuted, suffer it without bowing your head or apologizing. Look your antagonist in the eye and let him see compassion and forgiveness, but not fear, not guilt, and not apology. You should grow taller as he grows smaller. <sighs> I cannot guarantee you that your husband will melt before your mag magnum, I don't even know that word, display magnemios. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be like magnificent, but yeah, display of grace and fall into your arms, confessing to selfishness. Most marriages, she claims, will experience supernatural healing and deliverance. Okay. So then there's just, there's other, he's going to try to break you until you crawl back in your comfortable shell, but keep standing. Um, Use this opportunity to grow in grace and become my hero, the angel's hero and God's shiny example of an overcoming be content to grow in the grace of God and become a whole human instead of being a doormat, doormat for half a man. So basically a lot of the thing that they do um, is suffer for Christ's sake, suffer for righteousness sake, you know, just take it, suffer it, and you will please God. Okay. But I do see throughout the Bible, there being, um, you know, uh, advice to both husband and wife so that you can have a glorious marriage. You know, it's, it's not all on the woman. And then um, 202. I put, how is this not enabling? So let's go see what that says on page 202. Okay, so, oh, yes. It's a man that is a chronic adulterer. Um, dear Debbie, I had I don't have a question. It's a good report. Thank you for telling the truth for it set me for free. Shortly after we were married, my husband started going to strip clubs and meeting with prostitutes. I know this because when he got too guilty, he would confess for a while. I really wanted a divorce. I couldn't see how I could stand it much longer. And everyone agreed with me, except one couple, they counseled her. I don't want to read the whole letter. I'm already going long, but, um, you know, inside initially she would cry and verbalize her disappointment. How can I trust you? How do I know what you're doing? I didn't want my son to see me like that. And so she goes on to say about how she decided that she was going to stick it out, even though he was still doing this at the end, there is no report of, um, him stopping. He's still continuing to go to strip clubs. He's still continuing to, um, sleep with prostitutes. So what she did is she just wanted him to look big in her son's eyes. So she made him signs that said number one daddy and went to the office with her son and stood out there so he could see him. She just continued to overlook it. She did not address it. She continued to remain married to him because she never wanted her son to think um, less of his father. But this is my whole problem with that. As the son gets older, he's going to realize that this stuff is going on and he's going to then in his mind, deem this is good. This is acceptable. This is okay. This is how marriages work. It's all right for the dad to go to strip clubs. It's all right for the dad to sleep around prostitutes. And I will say too, that even when it comes to the physical relationship, if your husband is sleeping with prostitutes, he will be bringing home diseases to you. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, you have to think of yourself. There have been women that have gotten pregnant from husbands who have been out and they have um, a sexually transmitted disease. They did not know their husbands were cheating on them. They did not know their husbands were with prostitutes and they ended up having a uh, disabled child in some way or another because of the sexually transmitted diseases. There are so many dangers involved even in that, um, that you could be possibly even putting your own life on the line if you uh, continue to sleep with your husband who you know is sleeping with prostitutes. So that is something to throw out there as well. But I don't understand how that is not being an enabler when she knows of the behavior, but yet continues on like it's not going on. So um, she said she's reverencing God by reverencing her husband, not because her husband is a fit repre repre representative of Christ and not because he's a worthy subject, but because God placed her in subjection to her husband. 
Oh, yeah. So then she just kind of goes on with that. So I'm almost done. I'm just trying to kind of skip through these now. Okay. So 212 is, I think, one of the most horrifying stories in the book. Um, yes, it is. This is the story about the woman who was in an abusive relationship. So let's see. Um, they got married. She had been, she was a sweet young girl who was really dumb. She had a very tender heart. Her name was Sunny and she picked up, she would pick up hitchhikers to witness to, even though the older folks told her the practice was not wise. One day she picked up a young man of Arab descent who looked and talked very romantic. Um, she married him. She was soon pregnant with her first child. And in a matter of weeks, the violence began. Over the next seven years, Sonny was regularly subjected to his alcoholic rages and beatings, and she endured his flaunted unfaithfulness. She and the children were alone for days at a time, even weeks. Her husband stayed away with his friends. He returned home to vent his rage and take the few dollars she earned to support their growing family. When Sonny was pregnant with their third baby, Ahmed came home drunk and tried to kill her with a butcher knife. Um, let me read that again a little slower in case you didn't hear it. <sighs> She was pregnant with her third baby. Ahmed came home drunk and tried to kill her with a butcher knife. I don't know what that entailed. If he tried to slit her throat, if he tried stabbing her, if he cut her, I don't know. But um, every time Ahmed came home raging, she would leave the house with loud railing accusations and go to her mother's home and cry out her sorrows. She would get on the phone and call all of her friends and tell them what Ahmed was doing to her, but she did not leave him. So she's with this man. She's got two kids. She's pregnant with her third. And instead of thinking of them and going to safety, Debbie focuses on the fact that she would leave the house with loud railing accusations and go to her mother's home and cry out her sorrows. That's what she focuses on. She doesn't say anything about the protection of the kids or the unborn baby. She focuses on the fact that Sonny would leave and do this. Um, when I saw her at church meeting, a uh, huddled, sodden mass of, tear, mass of tears and exhaustion, Sonny confessed to plotting her husband's murder. She said she couldn't tolerate life anymore as it was. Uh, I don't blame you but her children needed her. So she decided to kill him. Um, her murder plan was well thought out and could have succeeded if God had not stopped her. I spent hours in prayer and counseling with Sunny that evening. I asked her to make a decision either to leave Ahmed once and for all and put the pieces of her life back together or to stay with him and begin a campaign of winning his heart and saving their life together. I fully expected her to leave him that night, but I discovered something amazing about her. Remember at the beginning, she said she was dumb. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. She called her dumb at the beginning. So God really wanted God's will in her life. She had grasped an eternal vision about life. And now she believed God would save her man. I knew of Sonny's weakness to blab everything. She couldn't keep a secret to save her life. I also knew her husband was very private and that her blabbing about his sins kept him in a rage as it would most lost men. Once again, it's partly her fault. He's always in a rage. I explained to Sonny that in order to win her husband's heart, she needed to reverence him. This did not mean she had to see some goodness or worth in him that was not really there, but she needed to show him esteem for the sake of children and herself. Sonny already did everything else right. Wow, she's acknowledging she does everything else right, except for blabbing with her big mouth, I guess. She was obedient, faithful, cheerful, a keeper at home, and a help me. So she had all those things down, yet it was still her fault that he was in a rage because she had a big mouth. I encouraged her to go one step further and look for an opportunity to reverence her husband. She was not to speak ill of him again. Her conversations with others as well as him could only would only be praise and appreciation. Sunny had a learner's heart. She took my advice and the change in her husband was obvious in just one week because it was all her fault. She had everything else perfect except she liked to tell her mom when he would beat her up. So it was her fault the marriage was failing. It is amazing how vulnerable a man is when a woman treats him with honor. He stopped going off with his drunken friends and got a job so he could help support the family. He came to, to church occasionally and seemed amazed at the comments people made. Okay, so this is another thing um, that I don't even agree with because he, remember, he is um, out there committing chronic adultery. He is, um, you know, he is drunk, drinking, he is beating her, and yet he is still welcome at a church family, which I don't know if he was before. I don't think he was saved. So I guess maybe that's why, because he wasn't saved and he wasn't like a member, but I don't know. I have, I have, I, that jumped out to me too. So anyways, basically how this ended, um, you know, previously when Sonny called her friends to tell them, to tell them, why is that in, 
what are they called? I can't remember. Why is it in quotation marks? <laughs> Why is it in quotation marks? Um, she called her friends to tell them what a creep her husband was. She was reinforcing to him the public or reinforcing to him the belief that she thought he was a loser. She publicly shamed him and he continued to be shameful. Her opinion became his frame of reference. Now, Sonny began to publicly exalt him with miraculous results. So there you have it, folks. If you got a man who tries to kill you with a butcher knife, tries to murder you, is beating you, is in a drunken rage all the time, it's always going to be your fault. If you just give him a few compliments in public, it will completely change him. I don't, I don't believe this at all. This, mm, I don't believe this at all. Okay, so it ended with, um, so I guess he... He became interested in God. By that time, he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. They were growing in the Lord together. So that's basically all she says about it. And she uses that as a good example. But to me, that's horrendous that she would even encourage him to go, encourage her to go back to him. All throughout the writings, I see that when men have committed horrible, horrible sins, such as adultery, such as abuse, such as molestation, the pearls do not think that anything will fix it other than the wife, the wife being a good, dutiful wife. They don't acknowledge that the man is just a creep. They don't acknowledge. And this is what I want to, I want to touch on in old Testament times, the man would have been put to death. Okay. So they don't even touch on that fact. Um, the man would have been put to death because it was his crime that he, was committed. It wasn't something his wife wouldn't be put to death for because it was not her fault that he did it. It was not her fault that he had a sin nature and he did not control himself. Um, if he committed adultery, he would be put to death. If he molested a child, he would be put to death. Um, and even in New Testament times, Jesus said about people that offended children, it was better that a millstone be put around their neck. So Jesus even encouraged capital punishment for those that hurt children. And I'm sorry, being a good wife will not change a perverted man. That's all there is about it. <clears throat> yes, that's exactly what happened, Kirsten. And exactly, Monica. I know. And not even what did I marry, but I remember, like I said, when I was done with this book, I just felt like, will my marriage even make it? It's it, what, and, and what am I doing? Am I? You know, it's all going to be my fault if this fails. And that's just the overall theme of this entire book. So I hated that story. Um, and I remember that's what stood out to me the first time I read it. And then page 236 on, I, I already kind of went through it. There are some good tips in it. The middle of the book is not really anything to write home about. Um, she just tells you how to manage your time better. Very generic stuff. I would not find a problem. I don't have a problem with any of that. Um, it seems fine to me. Okay. But this is where, um, she talks about sexual perversions and this is her advice. And then I'm going to read Michael Pearl's advice when it comes to this situation. And this is, um, the biggest problem I had with this entire book. So if your husband ever sexually handles your children, call the authorities, testify against him in court and pray that he gets at least 20 years in prison so that the children will be grown when he gets out. Visit him there and be an encouragement to him. Get him books and tapes on good Bible teaching and let him see the children three or four times a year in the prison visiting area. Children heal better from sexual assaults when they know the perpetrators, even their fathers, are punished for it. They're also less likely to follow in his steps. And then she quotes a verse, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he be cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Luke 17, 2. And I'm going to read Michael Pearl's horrible advice that he gives to people. <clears throat> and then Julia said her husband did write a version for men. Yes, I knew that, but I'm just talking about even uh, this book. It's just so, I know it was, you know, specifically towards women. It's a woman's book, but I think it would have been better with some disclaimers. And I don't, the whole book is just awful. So I can't, I can't even, there's, there's, like I said, I'm leaving out some of the good advice she gave mainly scripture. <laughs> And mainly, mainly stuff like that. But um, let me read this, this article. Okay, so he says, he says, if you or your children have been hit other than children being spanked, um, just a second. Doo, 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 doo. 
Okay. If you and the children have ever been hit other than the children being spanked, so as to leave discernible marks two hours later, and you genuinely fear that he will repeat his battering, you can take legal steps without divorcing your husband. To them, divorcing your husband is the the biggest sin there is. I would disagree. I would I would um, say that um, a man molesting his children is far greater sin than that. And if that ever happened um, to anyone I would know, I would recommend divorce. That is probably at that point, I think they are reprobate. Um, you know, I don't like to draw lines of where someone is reprobate when it, but when it comes to uh, sexual abuse on a child, I believe he has crossed that line. So um, in a moment when he's not angry, calmly inform him, inform him that the next time he physically assaults you or the kids, you are going to call the law and have him arrested. You must first resolve in your heart that you are willing to prosecute him and see him go to jail. I visit prisons every week. Listen to this. This is really weird. It is a great place to mull over the consequences of one deeds. And I have never met a prisoner that turned down a visit from anyone. Think about it, lady. It is a great time for writing love letters and sharing a three minute romantic phone call once a week. What? What? That's so weird. Guys who get out of prison run straight home to their ladies and treat them wonderfully for a while anyway. If your abusing husband fully understands that you have the power of the law behind you, he will learn to keep his hands in his pockets. Oh yeah, I'm sure that went great for all the women that went back to their abusive husbands. They ended up getting murdered. Great advice there. <clears throat> in fact, most women that end up getting it, statistically getting a restraining order against their physically abusive husband, he still finds a way. He's not good. He's already beating her. Do you think he's going to listen to a restraining order? He finds a way to get her and usually kill her. If your husband knows that you are the weaker vessel, weaker vessel desperately seeking your survival and that of the kids and that you are not trying to punish him, but you are going to stand by and continue to love him, that you are going to wait for him to get out of prison and then try to start over again, it may move his heart to fear, if not to repentance. You say he cannot help himself. Does he help himself when his peers, other men his own size, make him angry? Does he fly out of control and start hitting his boss or his employees? No, then he has self-control when he must. The law can make it a must, which will allow you to continue with him and demonstrate your womanhood and win him to yourself and then to your God. This is the biggest issue I had right here. But if your husband has sexually molested the children, you should approach him with it. I would hope so. If he is truly repentant, not just exposed, and is willing to seek counseling, you may feel comfortable giving him an opportunity to prove himself. As long as you know the children are safe. If there is any thought that they are not safe or he is not repentant and willing to seek help, then go to the law and have him arrested. So, okay, he tells women, if you think he's truly repentant, give him a chance. Basically, don't report it. Don't go tell the law what he has done. Allow him to still live under the same roof as your children. I'm sorry, a man that is molesting his children does not just stop. In fact, most of the time when people have been found guilty of molestation, there's been victims before and there will be victims after. So that is horrible, horrible advice. Horrible. And I think by law, when you know, if you as the wife know that your children have been molested, you confirm it with your children. Your husband has confessed it because he was caught. You are required by law to go tell. I know for me and my husband, if anyone tells us we are because we're mandated reporters because of him being a pastor. Um, so if anyone tells us that in confidence, we're still... But how much more if it's your own child? And why wouldn't you, why would you want to keep them in a situation where that could possibly happen again? That's horrible. Michael Pearl and his wife just said that they do better if they know that the, the person's being, you know, punished for it. So why would you continue to ignore it and just say, well, he's truly repentant. You know, we're going to give him another chance. Horrible advice, horrible But if he's not repentant and willing to seek help, then go to the law and have him arrested. So only that. Only if he, you know, isn't repentant. If you think he is, well then, you know, okay, come on. Oh, I just, I can't. That's horrible advice. Will this glorify God forever? <sighs> you ask, what if he doesn't repent? Even then, then you will be rewarded in heaven equal to the martyrs and God will have something to rub in the devil's face. Yeah, equal to the martyrs. So he acknowledges that staying with this man might even make you a martyr. <laughs> If he's going to continue to abuse, God hates divorce always, forever, regardless, without exception. Well, you know what? You know what else he hates? He hates pedophiles and he hates people who hurt children 
it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast and he be cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones in Luke in New Testament times. He hates that. You know what? In Bible times, they would have been put to death if they if they molested any of these children. So yeah, no, you don't just give them another chance. You don't just overlook that. I'm getting really fired up right now because when it comes to children, you are their protector. As a mother, they are your you know, your husband is to protect you. And if he's not doing his job, you need to protect your children from him. I would never put my children in a situation where they could be molested again by someone in my life. I'm just like, yeah, he seems repentant. Let's continue to give him another chance. That is horrible advice. And if you, if your children ever come to you with stories of their father inappropriately touching them, you go to the authorities. Yes. Immediately you kick him out of your home. First of all, you get your children to a safe place and you prosecute him to the full extent of the law. And then he is never to be around your children again. That's my advice for that. That's horrible. Horrible, 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 horrible advice. Okay. So I got to go quick because I'm really going over my time. Okay. So there is, um, another thing just to kind of add. So then I go like a hundred pages. Okay. So most of it's about loving their children. Um, it's not really anything earth shattering. I would agree with most of that advice. Um, when it comes to your children and different things like that, there is a really weird letter in here. And this goes along with the whole philosophy of it's always the woman's fault. And I'm not even going to read this whole letter on air because it's really disturbing. If you want to look it up, you can, it's called bad Bob. Basically it's, um, Bob is the main character. Lydia is the youth pastor's wife. So bad Bob is at her, um, they're at a hotel. Bad Bob stays behind because he's not feeling well. He turns on the, the TV and, um, in slow motion, there's a woman walking up steps. All he could see was the woman's behind encased in a short leather skirt with a slit up the backside. And so that's like, they call it soft porn. So from that moment on, he has a hard time controlling his thoughts. Okay. So that's all what starts it. This, this thing, watching this woman walking up the steps. Well, a couple of years later, he's sitting in church when Lydia, the youth director's wife, stood up directly in front of him to take her youngest child to the bathroom. His mouth got terribly dry as he stared at her round behind in case this is just so weird with a slit up the back. Um, So she bent over to get something and he just lost control of his bodily functions, basically. And it talks about the shame of that. So the rest of the time, he marries a sweet little woman. And, you know, she doesn't understand that her husband struggles with these thoughts. And when they go to church, he won't ever sit behind someone who has on like a shorter skirt or a tight skirt because he just can't control himself and he can't control his bodily reactions to it. So it's just showing again that, um, you know, and, and he blames, you know, his, his wife, he wished his wife, he wishes that his wife knew how high his sexual needs were. And he wishes that she wasn't tired from dealing with the kids all day. And, you know, she keeps making excuses like it hurts, something doesn't feel right. And, you know, she knew he had, she knew she had put out once a week. So she came to him half-heartedly, which caused him to never really get total satisfaction. So because she's half-heartedly, he's never satisfied. He's struggling with lust because it all goes back to the soft porn he saw when he was a kid. And basically everything is the woman's fault. It's her fault that is sexual, you know, he's always sexually frustrated and it's all these other women's fault. And so I, one thing I've just noticed with Michael Pearl and I downloaded one of his books and I read, it was like, a, um, he was reading through Proverbs, um, Song of Solomon, I'm sorry. He was reading through Song of Solomon and the part where he's trying to, her lover is trying to get to her to open the door and she's not fast enough to open it. Um, she goes looking for him and men of the city beat her up basically. And, um, he claims in there that it's her fault because she did not open the door enough to her protector who then would have protected her from that. But because she didn't, it was her fault. She got beat up. They never put any blame on the men at all. Um, so I don't know if this is just something that Michael told her throughout their marriage you know, I have really high needs and you need to make, meet them. If you're not, it's my fault. If I'm sexually frustrated, it's my fault. If I'm lusting, they pretty much put the fault of the man having the affair with the secretary on the wife and told her she needed to be more attractive. So it's just throughout the whole book. I think you've gotten the gist of that. Everything's always the woman's fault. And, um, they never put any responsibility 
on the man. I will say there was one story that I really liked out of here on page 367. It was about a woman who had a lot of little children and she was very, she lacked joy. It was really hard raising the kids, but thankfully her husband was a good man and he encouraged her to start a photography, start um, using her photography because she had a nice camera. So she started doing that. Well, the photography business grew and grew and grew and they were both doing it years later. And she was just talking about how it was good that she had something that she could pour herself into other than just taking care of kids all the time. And I completely agree with that. In fact, I'm surprised that Debbie included it in this book because the theme of the whole book up to that point had been your only identity is in your man. You need to put away, put aside all your dreams, all your expectations, all your rights, and you need to just focus on your man. So, um, I do agree with, it was a different woman. I don't know her name, but it was a different woman that wrote this story. I do agree that as women, we do need, our identity is not fully wrapped up in our man. <laughs> our identity is actually wrapped up in Christ and, um, in Christ, all are one male, female, Jew, Gentile, you know, we're all the same and our identity is not in even what our husband does or, um, I, I believe in being a good wife and I believe in being a good mother, but when we put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and we have rough patches, then it's all our life is going to come crashing down and then we won't have joy. So I do encourage, I know when it's, when you have little kids, it's harder, but I do encourage women as they get older to start branching out and write. If you like it craft, if you like it for me, I love to write for me. I love to teach piano lessons. I love my music. And that was always something my husband encouraged me. in. so I will say that that is good advice in that. I had one more page 383. I think I went over most of the stuff that I had. Um, yeah, the bad Bob story is really weird. You can read it if you don't believe me. Um, I would say I would lend out my book to anyone in my church, but it's on my Kindle. So, so yeah. Um, so that story was actually a good one. And then I had one on 383. Okay. I received many letters from women saying this kind of like wraps up my summary of kind of how her life has been. By the way you write, you would think all men are like your husband. Huh, I hope not. <laughs> no. And my husband wasn't always like he is now. He is now a work of art and I don't mean his body. God has changed him over the years. And if some of you are married to him, even now, you would be writing me letters asking for advice on how to find the grace to endure, how to find the grace to endure her marriage. That just makes me sad. <sighs> I have come to like the bear in him, sometimes teddy bear and sometimes real bear, but he is always my bear. Um, that makes me sad because I don't think of my husband as, or our marriage as something I just, I, I have to endure this. God, please give me the grace to endure this marriage. It's so awful. <laughs> I, I don't that's, I don't endure my marriage. You know, I have fun in my marriage and I, I love my marriage and, um, I love my husband and there is no fear in our marriage when it comes to wondering, oh no, oh no. If he's, is he going to leave me? You know, whatever. So, um, yeah, KJV Kayla, I, and that's where, you know, I felt like I had to say something. I had someone reach out to me recently and they said, um, I have a friend, they're having marriage problems and created to be as help me was, um, suggested to her that she read. And I know you've said that you've seen red flags before, and this isn't even something that I really was looking forward to doing a book review on, because I know that there are so many women that claim it has changed their marriage. And this is what I'm going to say. I think there are good principles in it and coming from me, someone who has been um, saved since I was four and a half. I've been raised in a Baptist home. I've been taught godly principles when it comes to marriage. Um, I think it would be okay for someone like me to read, to read something like this. But for a younger Christian that has not been taught godly principles, especially if you have a young punk of a man who is just a jerk, who maybe is rotten to the core but you married him, not knowing this, you know, you never truly know what a man's like until you marry him and you live with him 24 hours a day. So you married him. Now, you know, you're, you know, committed to this marriage. You're stuck in this marriage. I, I think it would be very hurtful in the long run and might even destroy your marriage with some of these principles. 
so that um, many women who I have seen that have tried reading this and incorporating to the max every single thing encouraged in this book become a shell of what they once were. They lose, they lose their spunk and they lose their fire. And um, I know for me, I, just speaking of me and my husband, I think he would be a little sad if I lost some of my spunk and my fire. That's one of the things that attracted him to me was my, my convictions and my zeal and um, my fire. So I think, I think he would miss that. I, I don't, my husband is not the type that would like a Stepford wife. And this book kind of is what it demands of women to be a Stepford wife. Just, you know, don't expect any right to marriage. Um, it's almost borderline Muslim ish, the way the Muslim men treat their women. Um, if you think about it, it is, it, especially when you're reading it, it is kind of like that, especially the story of Sunny going back to her abusive husband. So I have, I'm not someone who studied statement analysis in depth. I'm not a professional. I'm just someone who's been around people, heard their stories, counseled people, and watched people my entire life. I've been in ministry for over 20 years. And this is how the book came across to me. I came across to me like it was written by a woman who was married to a controlling narcissist. <laughs> um, my friend, and I've told you about this earlier, Mrs. Jujana Anderson did a video about their courtship and honeymoon. I haven't watched it since the first time when I watched it, but I remember the story striking me as odd when I read it. And that's why I looked it up um, again, just to reread that story. To me, this book was written by someone well-versed in learning how to survive. This would be my advice for anyone planning to get married someday. So number one, be sure about who you're marrying. Obviously you can't know everything, but make sure you meld with the person you picked out. Number two, marriage is for life, but if he turns out to be a reprobate and is molesting your kids, please get out. Do not allow a man who has molested your children to stay under the same roof as you. Again, in an abusive situation, get help. Leave with the children, get help. If you choose to divorce, remain single. Many go from one bad situation right into another. <clears throat> And I'm not even one who will ever encourage divorce. There's always, unless I knew specifically in my life and watched the situation happening. And I knew he was an actual reprobate. I think some, the word reprobate is too loosely used and we have to be careful about that. So um, many go from one bad situation right into another. You obviously have a hard time picking a, a good man. So focus on your kids, raise them well and remain single. That would be my advice. If you are truly married to someone who is abusing you or turns out to be a reprobate, focus on the things of the Lord. So while this book has many good points and yes, biblical advice at times, I cannot condone um, the advice from greater joy ministries because of the red flags I see. I've also seen the fruit in my life of women that have tried incorporating this book in their life. Some of the women who swear by it still have miserable marriages. Often, if you're a miserable person, that's going to come across in all your relationships. And this is my advice for a good marriage. Having lived it and given this advice to others, practice the biblical model for the home. Learn to be a joyful person, slow to anger and be forgiving. Treat him with respect and the way you want to be treated. Your happiness does not lie in a perfect marriage. It should lie in your salvation and Jesus Christ, um, your identity in him, etc. When you make Jesus first, usually the other things fall into line. Marriage is for keeps and marriage is not one-sided. Marriage problems are not all the woman's fault. Marriage problems, um, it just to, to say that I think is very, very shallow. And I, I just, I feel like it's coming from her experience and what she's been told. So I've spotted a couple of things in Michael Pearl's teaching. If a man fails, it's a woman's fault. A man has an affair. His wife wasn't satisfying him in the bedroom. A man lost. It was the woman's problem. I downloaded his book um, because I'm crazy and I wanted to delve into his mind a little bit. And then, like I told you earlier in there, he blames the woman for being beat up by the men in the city because she took too long to open the door to her lover. I see this common thread wo woven throughout and I cannot condone that. If a man commits adultery, it's because he has a problem, not his wife. If a man lusts, it's because he has a problem with his heart and mind, not his wife. Oftentimes it stems from pornography use. If a man has a pornography problem, it is his problem, not his wife's. If a man abuses his wife, that is his fault. It is not the wife's fault. 
It is faulty to say that all the blame lies on a woman. I can see where narcissistic controlling men would love this book. And that's why I see a real danger with it. So many men like to focus demanding that the women obey, 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 while completely missing the part of loving their wives. It takes two people wholly committed to God doing their part to make a marriage beautiful. Yes, a woman should do her part. And I encourage that. But I think the man has the bigger responsibility if he is a true man of God to make the marriage work. So many times Debbie warned the woman, if you don't do this, he will divorce you. I've personally never had that fear. Why did she have that fear? And why did she say it so many times in her book? Would Michael have walked away if she did not conform to what he wanted in a woman? I can't imagine being in a marriage where I feared that if I did not shape up, my husband would walk away from me. Where is the true love in that relationship? To obey out of fear? To love out of fear? To serve out of fear? I think that is my biggest red flag with this book. She was so much of it was motivated by fear. Do X, Y, Z, and you can have a beautiful marriage. And usually it's your fault if you don't have a beautiful marriage. If you nag at all, aren't available sexually 24 hours a day or complain, he will divorce you. That's not a happy marriage. That's not a freeing marriage. That's a marriage fraught with stress and fear and tension. While I did like a few parts of this book, interestingly enough, parts that other women helped her with, (laughs) I cannot in good conscience recommend it to a weaker Christian. I would suggest getting a Titus II mentor, delving into the word yourself, or being around other older godly women and asking their advice when faced with situations. Because I have the Holy Spirit living in me, I was able to figure out the solutions to most problems I had, even as a young bride. And you know what? I'm not perfect still being married over 20 years. I still nag at times. I still say things I shouldn't at times. I've learned to control my tongue a lot better, but there's still times when I I slip up or I fail. But you know what? I don't have this fear in my mind that if I mess up again, he's going to leave me. And I just, I feel sad for the women that are at that point in their marriage where they do fear their husband walking out on them because they had a bad day and they're grouchy. Um, I feel sad for them. I feel sad for all the women that have maybe taken this book and tried so hard and their marriage still failed. And they're now they're living in a state of despondency because they believe it's their fault. And I think a lot of it would be from teachings in this book, (laughs) making it seem like everything is the woman's fault. So you can have a beautiful marriage. I cannot in good conscience though, recommend, um, no greater joy ministries just from red flags I have seen. And if you want to see more red flags, you can look up that story about, uh, Michael Pearl's honeymoon and just kind of see what he brags about, what he talks about, what his focus is on. I think that's very, very revealing because you know, what we think about and who we are comes out in our words. And overall, I see a theme of it's always the woman's fault. I'm very, you know, sexual man, I need my needs met and very braggadocious and very arrogant. And I just, I don't know. Debbie seems happy now from videos I've seen. Maybe he's mellowed out through the years, but my heart goes out to the young bride that she was my heart goes out to what she put up with on her honeymoon so um my honeymoon was one of the most beautiful weeks of my life just getting to know my husband and his tender love for me and the way he cherished me and I just I can't imagine that being my honeymoon story there's so anyways I know I went long I knew I would (laughs) but I hope you enjoyed it you know what if this book has helped you, tell me about it. Let me know. Let me know what parts it's helped you in. If this book has been detrimental, please leave a comment telling me how, you know, interact. Let me know. Let me know where I'm off. Let me know if you had a different viewpoint when you were going through the book. And, um, actually, absolutely. Jalissa, I agree with you. The Bible is the best book and women can try to write books. (laughs) I can try to give you marriage advice but the Bible has all the answers and it's pretty balanced in the Bible. You know, I believe in women doing their part, but I also believe in the men doing their part. And I believe when a marriage fails, it's because both spouses did, didn't do something that they were supposed to do. They didn't do something biblically that they were supposed to do. When a marriage succeeds, all glory goes to God. 
And I do believe that both spouses were fully invested in living their marriage the way that God wanted them to live it. So I hope this has been a help. (laughs) And I'm sorry, I did not even get through all your comments. Um, I'm sure you left some good ones, but we actually had quite a few watching today. So go ahead and share this with anyone that you think it will help. I know it's kind of long, but hopefully you get the gist and the spirit of what I was trying to say. I'm sure there's more I could have said, but that's about all I got for now. So if I, if I'll, um, if I think of anything that I forgot, I'll try to leave it down in the comments and I'll link to, um, those articles that I was talking about. So you all have a nice day and join me again on Monday. Uh, this was just kind of a special show, but Monday I'm going to be going live at 7 PM central talking about just overcoming emotional hurts in our life. So 